ask you in a half hour to uh, understand that you receive something that has taken me 30 years to uh, grasp and I'm Jewish and that is that the church is inexorably joined with the people of Israel in the design and providence of God you'll have to take my word for it right now I'll give you a few scriptures but I want to put that thought in your heart and in your spirit and tell you with absolute certitude that until the church consciously understands that and willfully accepts that with joy it is ipso facto not the church it's only an institution that purveys blessings for its congregants can you follow that? Oh, good. We speak the same language? I want to, shall I repeat what I just said? Then, then I'll pray. You'll see why we need prayer. Everything in hell, every power of darkness, is calculated against your understanding that statement and receiving it. Everything in your gentilic nature, everything that has to do with being a non-Jew in the world and especially in New York City is calculated against understanding and receiving this statement but if you will not you condemn the church to being non-church you condemn it to being mere institution only calculated to provide services for its members which is not the apostolic definition of church that will be unto him a glory. God in his great wisdom has brought you into something that had its inception and history long before the word church was ever invented. It was the existing congregation of the righteous saints of the true believers of Israel all throughout history from Abraham who received the Messiah when he came who were there at Pentecost and were filled with the Holy Spirit when it was poured out from heaven and continued on as the Kahal that's the Hebrew word spelled phonetically Q-E or Q-U-H-A-L the Kahal of God which is the congregation of the true believers you who were far off and without God and without hope in the world were brought nigh by the blood of Israel's Messiah what's another word for Messiah that we more commonly use because it's in our Bibles and don't realize when we're using it that it actually means Messiah or Mashiach which is the Hebrew word. What word do we have? Christ. How many of you know that the word Christ is Greek? From the Christos, the Greek word, from the Greek scriptures. But it was a translation of a Hebrew word, Mashiach or Messiah, which has a much more Hebraic ring to it, doesn't it? You know, when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn with my brother Lenny, and we heard the name Jesus Christ we looked at each other with a blank stare as if who's that we don't know a single Jew who has that name none of you ever explained to us because many of you were not there but are you able today to explain to your Jewish fellow office worker or colleague or neighbor that Christ is not a name at all it's not a family name at all. It's a title. Yeshua Ha Mashiach. Ha in Hebrew is the Messiah. Did you know that? Really know that? Because when you begin to know that, you are taking first steps to understanding that you are called to an Hebraic faith. God wants to take you Gentiles who are far off and without God and without hope in the world. How dismal can you get and bring you 
nigh. What's another word for that? Near. Into what? The covenants, the promises, and the hopes, and the commonwealth of Israel. How do you like them apples? Many of you don't like it. It pinches you. It sounds confining. You're not altogether responsive to Israel or to Jews, which is the condition of Gentiles in the world who are without the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God. Which God? The God of Israel and the God of Jacob. Only that spirit in a Gentile can give a person an affinity for and a warmth toward a people who are otherwise repellent or repulsive or rejected in the world. You want to to know something? This talk this morning is life or death for Jews in this city because of you. I have such a sober theme, but I can't even begin to open it until we take these first steps of understanding, which I myself did not understand in my 32 years as a believer until recently has the Lord begun to open my understanding about what the church is as an unbroken continuum of the faith once and for all given the saints going all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now I was only recently in Germany and I have a great love for that nation as a Jewish believer. I didn't always have it. For the first 35 years of my life I had the same enmity and distaste that some of you presently have for Jews. I had for Germans for much better reason than, than your feeling. We were systematically annihilated at German hands in a phenomenon called the Holocaust. The understanding of which is still lost to the world and even to the church, let alone to the Jewish people. Now I have a love for that people by the same spirit that God invites you to have a love for his ancient Israel and for the present expression of that people in your own midst. But when I go to Germany, you know what I do? I look for Jewish cemeteries. I'm not a morbid one who likes to skulk around in graveyards, but there's something melancholy, poignant. Who can spell that? Who can understand that? P-O-I-G-N-A-N-T. Come on, guys. We have the greater responsibility than the world to embrace language and its meaning and to jealously guard it. Poignant means a bit of melancholy, a, a bittersweet sadness over something. When you walk through a Jewish cemetery... Any of them that remain that have not been toppled over and destroyed in the Nazi time or even now by neo-Nazis. N-E-O. What does that mean? New Nazis. There's something very strange and haunting when you walk through these cemeteries and see the tombstones that are covered with moss and the Hebrew inscriptions are effaced by time and by weather. And I found one this time near Nuremberg that goes back to the 14th century. That the stones were so great that the Nazis could not topple them or or destroy them. And I came back that night to a meeting and I looked into the face of charismatic Germans. And I said, how is it that my Jewish people have been in your midst for 2,000 years from the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. and of Jerusalem, cast into the Roman Empire, 
of which Germany was a center, though it was not called Germany at that time, and had lived in the Rhine, the Rhineland and other commercial centers throughout the whole history of modern Germany, and died with their tombstones still bearing the Star of David without any cognizance that the God whom you celebrate is their God. And I looked in their faces and I said, Do you really consciously know and willfully embrace that your God is the God of Jacob? That your God is the God of Israel? and that there is no other God, and that this designation is not some little cheapy piece of information, it's the way in which God intends to be understood and recognized and received by his believing people. Have you known God that way? I, I asked these Germans, because I can't believe that you have and that for 2,000 years you have had a remnant of Israel in your midst who never once understood that the God whom you celebrate and ostensibly worship is their God. Or else they would not be buried in separate graveyards with their Star of David, still defending a God whom they think to be different and other than the God you celebrate. How come you never communicated him to your Jewish neighbors? Good question. If they had, history might have been radically different. Now I want to pray, because I've said enough already to fill an entire sermon, and I haven't yet begun my real theme. Lord, give these children grace grace to hear, grace to understand. Pry open, my God, hearts and understandings that the world has sought to keep a lid on and down and against the kind of truth that you want communicated to this church in this city that will indeed make it a church of an apostolic kind, with apostolic calling, with the portent for apostolic glory. Show them, my God, the mystery of the church that was given Paul to reveal that is yet still not understood 2,000 years later and is even resisted. And show them what is yet future in their relationship with that people, which if they don't assume it and fulfill it, you yourself cannot come as the king of Israel and sit upon the throne of David and rule out of the holy city of Jerusalem from the holy hill of Zion so that your law can go forth to the nations and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Show them all these things in the space of about a half hour as only you can. And we'll thank you and give you the praise in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Let's look briefly at Ephesians. Well, where would we turn to catch God's statement on the genius of the church, not as some innovation or novelty, but as the very continuation of Hebraic faith? Where is that statement made in the New Testament? Hmm. Back to the drawing board. Ephesians chapters 2 and three. Who is the steward of the mystery? The Apostle Paul. The chief apostle of the faith to whom these mysteries are given. And he says, pray for me that I might have grace to utter and to make clear these mysteries. Because what is a mystery? Is it a detective story? What is the word mystery, biblically speaking? Hmm. We're going to have to go on a retreat together or something. A mystery is something hidden by God. It's not for people to gawk at. It's not some cheapy made available 
for the mere curious. It is a something jealously kept by God and reserved for the historic moment of his choosing by which then it shall be revealed by the operation of the Spirit. You cannot delve into and understand mysteries by the operation of mind. It's a spirit phenomenon. Or else we would despair. So in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul uses two words, circumcision and uncircumcision. Who were the people of the circumcision? The Jews. Who were the, and whom did they call the uncircumcision? The Gentiles. I, I wish we had all kinds of time, guys. Can you understand how Jews who were raised up in the law of Moses and were kept as a separated people who could not so much as even mix linen and wool in their clothing or harness a mule uh, with an ox and were kept from all of the practices of the Gentile world around them because God didn't want them to be sucked into the idolatry of that world and gave them all kinds of commandments for separation from the Goyim. The Goyim means what? The Gentiles. And Lenny and I remember when my mother used to spit that word out. The Goyim. They're the other. They're the ones with the snub nose and the freckles who are hostile toward us and given an opportunity will do us in as history has amply demonstrated. There is a long-standing historic enmity between Gentiles and Jews. Not the least of the reason, ironically, is the very principle of separation that God established for the people Israel to keep them from the idolatry and degrading practices of the Gentiles who drank beer out of skulls, who had temples of prostitution, whose religions were shot through with perverse sensuality. You know all these things. So that when the Messiah came and the Holy Spirit subsequently fell, the Jewish believers received this as being exclusively the fulfillment of their Hebraic faith. It was not for the Goyim. They were outside. They were the uncircumcision. They were the unclean. So that Peter, who brought the first message to the Gentiles had to receive a vision in a trance on a rooftop to persuade him that it was okay. It was kosher to bring the message of the faith to non-Jews. Is that right? You remember what came down on a sheet before him? A picture of animals that Jews were told not to eat as being unclean and the voice of God came in the trance to Peter and said, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, not me, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean. He was an Orthodox Jew. And the Lord said, Peter, take and eat. Not me, Lord. You know, Peter. And the Lord said, what I have made clean, call thou not unclean. And in that very moment, someone is knocking on the door downstairs it was a delegation from the home of a Gentile, Cornelius, sending for Peter to come and instruct them in the way of God. He would not have gone. He would not have entered the home of a Gentile, unclean and uncircumcised, except he had first received a revelation by God in a trance. So deep was the separation between Gentiles and Jews it took a supernatural act of God to break in to the historic separation by which you are now sitting in the assembly of God and the believers of the faith of the God of Israel who before would have been far off.
and without God and without hope in the world. Can you understand that? And now God is saying, now you who are near, you bring in in the last days those who are presently far off and without God who are Jews without Christ. Your function and calling is to be the expression of my life to them who are now alienated from the faith into which you have been called. And that's the purpose of your salvation. Have you embraced that purpose? Are you fulfilling that purpose? And where is that purpose clearly articulated and stated? In what book of the New Testament? Romans chapter 11 where Paul says is God finished with them? because that's what the, the believers in Italy were beginning to ask uh, is God finished with them? they've stoned the, the, the prophets that were sent unto them they crucified the Messiah it must be that they're finished and we now take over we are now the Israel of God and they're passe Paul says God forbid you should think that they've only temporarily stumbled they're not permanently out of the way. They're broken off that you who are wild branches might be grafted in. For what purpose? That you might move them to jealousy. Oh, you dear guys, there's a drama of an exquisite kind that gives meaning to our, uh, uh, to our existence as the people of God especially in the city of two and a half million Jews. And you can be the church in New York City and not know this, not consciously embrace this, not consciously and willfully seek to fulfill this, will condemn you to a mere charismatic claptrap. Because to move Jews to jealousy as we say in Yiddish, Mamma Mia, is no small thing. Try it on me, if you could have imagined what I was in, by, in my, by my 35th year. Tough, angry, hostile, anti-Christian. It takes something to win that people back to their own God whether they are atheists, which most of us are as Jews today, or even orthodox religionists, we are equally alienated from the God of Israel and don't even know it. It's only your demonstration and your conveying the reality of our God that makes us aware of our own lack. Can you see that? There's no more powerful testimony of the living God and the radiance of His life except that light which shines out of the face of a Gentile. That's how I got saved. Remember when uh, Simeon was called to the temple and the Lord said he would not be allowed to see death till he had seen the Lord's Messiah? And he picked up that babe. Many babes came every day for dedication. But he saw that babe and said, this is it. I've seen the salvation of the Lord. Now I can pass away. He, he, had, he said, I've seen the light that lightens the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Same light. But we'll never know it as God's glory till we see it as your light. And your light will burn the brighter when you understand the mystery of the faith consciously embrace it and seek for the fulfillment of it in these last days so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 remember because we forget we never knew that formerly you the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands remember that you were at that time separate from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope 
and without God in the world. What makes the faith the faith is the covenants, the promises, and the hopes of Israel, which have now become yours. And when the hope of Israel comes as king, that's your Lord. That's the second coming. That's what we're waiting for. But it's their hope which has become ours. We're linked with them, and we have their hope more consciously than they themselves have today. Jews are hopeless without God. They are without God and without hope in the world. And that's why the Magic Kingdom is a Jewish enterprise. Disneyland is, a, is run by a Jewish CEO, corporate executive. Much of the entertainment world is largely in Jewish hands and through Jewish genius by men who have no purpose for their energy and for their genius than entertainment and raking up millions through it. They are without hope and they don't know it until the day of eternity. Then there's a shriek and a howl when they see the darkness that will receive them. Unless you get to them first. That's God's purpose. But now in Messiah, Jesus, you who formerly, formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. For he himself is our peace who have made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, and by it having put to death the enmity. Oh, this is so much. We need weeks together for this. But will there ever be a resolution and reconciliation between Serbs and Bosnians and Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and uh, black Africans and white and, and every place in the world where there is division and strife until the church demonstrates in its own body the reconciliation between Gentile and Jew being made into one new man? The answer is not the UN. The answer is the church in the demonstration with this historic people to be made one new man. When that will be established, the rest follows. So we have a historic task. Is this over your heads? Should be. But is this being recorded, uh, fellas? Good. Get the tape. Now, I'm not, I'm not joking with you. It's just too difficult in one hearing to just absorb all this. But get the tape and dwell on it and hear it over and contemplate and pray for the revelation of the mystery. We're locked in with a people that we would not have chosen that in the world today are becoming increasingly obnoxious whether in the state of Israel or anywhere. And yet God calls us to be reconciled with them in their Messiah and to win them through some demonstration of ourselves corporately to something that is for them a distaste called the church. You should have been with me yesterday in uh, the Lubavitcher Hasidic community in Brooklyn. You should have been with me with the ultra-Orthodox, with the beards, and sitting through their Saturday morning Shabbat service. It's another world. And yet God wants to make those two worlds one. And who's to take the initiative? You. It's, it's everything to be feared. These Jews are formidable, antagonistic, brilliant, and we feel ourselves inadequate and incapable. It puts the whole issue on the trust of God through His Spirit. It compels us to rise 
to maturity and to come to stature as a church that intercedes for and can witness to the most formidable opponents to the gospel, the Jew. Paul himself says in Romans 11, they are the enemies of the gospel, and then he adds, for your sake. So you have a choice before you. You can be a patsy and a pew sitter and someone anonymously in the back of the room whose faith never climbs and just goes on from one a succession of service to another or you can embrace the mandate of God as the church to this people and rise in apostolic faith and glory no shortcuts and I'm not saying this because I'm Jewish I'm saying this because I'm a messenger of God to the church Paul repeats that theme in verse 19 of chapter 2 so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with saints with the saints and are of God's household which saints? Which, with the Jewish saints not every Jew rejected Jesus there's an unbroken continuum of faith even from the inception of New Testament Christianity you have been brought into something that already existed the only thing is that what makes it new is that Gentiles who were once far off are now included it's an astonishment that took a trance to communicate to Peter but you need to know that you need to appreciate that you need to be grateful for that because once you are then you know what you feel like you need to communicate that sense of gratitude to the people from whom you have received faith in the knowledge of their God it's a motive to be to this Jewish people what we want and then in chapter 3 Paul speaking about the mystery of Christ in which God has given him insight and understanding and in verse 5 which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit what? what is this mystery? to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body it's a body that existed before they were saved but now continues and fellow partakers of the promise in Messiah Jesus through the gospel what we call the church is a mystery of the inclusion of those who were once far off into the already existing and continuing faith of the God of Israel isn't that a different way of looking at the church the church is not a novelty it's not some new thing that was coined from the day of Pentecost it's the continuation of something that had a long history that the Jews of old and faithful Abraham and all who were of the faith of Abraham looked for the coming and the fulfillment of the Messiah who would complete their faith according to the prophetic scriptures and what we uh, cherish as charismatics and Pentecostal the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was their promise in the, in the prophet Joel that in the last days God would pour his spirit out on all Jewish flesh and some of it has lapped over on us are, are you getting are you following me are you irritated are you resentful uh, do you feel cheated are you do you have a breadth of magnanimity and grace to feel yourself in kinship with this people whose, into whose faith God has brought you though they themselves today are out of that faith and will remain so until you move them to a jealousy to a receive it we've come full circle now that's not even my message that's just the preliminary my message is actually in the prophet Jeremiah chapter 30 
which is little known to the church, but it should be. The word that came from the Lord saying to Jeremiah, write all the words which I have spoken to you in the book, for behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. How are they doing now? Lousy. Both in Israel and outside of it. And though I don't have time to develop this, will you take my word for it? It's going to get worse. It's going to get so bad that don't be shocked <coughs> if present day Israel, political Israel, suffers a disaster of such a kind that will extinguish it as a political entity in the world. That there will be a war, violence, destruction, devastation, and expulsion again out of Israel. God is going to bring them all the way down before he will bring them up. I'm one of the few spokesmen who see and openly proclaim the coming disaster of Israel. And I do so on the basis of the scriptures, and in particular the text that we're now looking at, called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's every day increasing, and it will become worse, until it will be a disaster beyond all proportions, not only within the present state of Israel, but wherever Jacob is to be found in the world. I wish that I were a false prophet, and I would be proved wrong in my expectation that Jews are going to suffer persecution throughout all the world of a fierce, unremitting kind to, unto death, including in this country. What would you think if I said that what happened in Nazi Germany in the 1930s to Jews is going to happen in this country in the 1990s or shortly thereafter? That there will come such a fierce national hatred that to stand for the Jew and to be identified with him is to put your own life in peril. You say, could that happen here, Art? I announced that in New Zealand only a matter of weeks ago, and I was interviewed by a New Zealand Christian magazine, and the journalist said, do you think it could happen here? This is unthinkable. I said, oh yeah? It was unthinkable in Germany before 1930 also. And Germany's culture and civilization was infinitely more deep and more established than your own. But within the space of a decade, whoosh, it all came collapsing down and not one institution stood against Hitler and the Nazi ideology of looking upon the Jews as vermin and decreeing their extermination. The Christian church in Germany became the German national church and followed the policies of its Fuhrer. How do you think we will do if that Antichrist spirit comes to this nation? God says, I will restore their fortunes. I will bring them back to the land because I think they're going to be expelled from it and they shall possess it, which they're not presently able to do now these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah for thus says the Lord I have heard a sound of terror of dread and there is no peace ask now and see if a male can give birth why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth and why have all faces turned pale alas for that day is great there is none like it and it is the time of Jacob's trouble or distress, but he will be saved from it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will break his yoke from off their neck. That's the Antichrist. will tear off their bonds, and strangers shall no longer make them their slaves. I think this is yet future in Israel's experience. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I raised up for them. 
David their king is Jesus and fear not Jacob my servant declares the Lord do not be dismayed O Israel for behold I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity Jacob shall return and shall be quiet and at ease and no one shall make him afraid you need to read this carefully at your own leisure and know that we're not reading something about Israel's past but Israel's future this people are on a collision course with tragedy, devastation, expulsion, and slavery. Fear and terror. Even now, there's not a day in Jerusalem or in that nation where an Israeli can breathe easily with any security because a bomb can go off at any moment and does by terrorists who are willing suicides and make themselves live bombs on Israeli buses and it's only the beginning you need to know you are connected with this drama this time of Jacob's trouble will not be confined to Israel but wherever Jacob is in the world and Jacob is two and a half million strong in New York City what will you do when the heat comes on and Jews will be discriminated against, prejudiced, persecuted, and finally uprooted and driven. And the only safety that they will find and the only refuge will be that that will be given them by believers at a time when to do so is to put yourself at risk. How many people know the name Anne Frank? The Dutch Jewish girl who was kept hidden with her family till the very last weeks of the war and then by one fluke or another their hiding place was revealed all of the family perished except the father but the Dutch people who hid them died with them in the concentration camps the church is going to be tested saints by its willingness to stand with and identify with this people in the time of their soon coming distress and when I knew I was coming to New York I knew I had but one theme to express to this congregation prepare yourself for soon coming eventualities that will make a requirement of you of such a kind that unless you're really a saint really a true believer more than a piece of flim flam and a Sunday attender you will not pass the test and if you don't extend mercy to them in this city of the kind that we sang about today they will not receive mercy and Paul says in Romans 11 that by your mercy they may obtain mercy I don't know how you're going to do it I don't know where you're going to hide them in your attics or your basement I don't know how you're going to help them out of this city because it will be a place of death for them where they are recognized and it'll, they'll be finished they need to be spirited out in a chain of places of refuge and flight from place to place until they make it to us in Minnesota because 22 years ago God called me to the present property where we are in the remote wilderness of North America as a place of refuge for Jews we're in something together saints that's why I'm here and somehow when this when these dark clouds gather and this thing breaks loose we are into a drama of a remarkable kind that has to do with the life and death of a Jewish people if they all perish the Lord does not come because he is contained in the heavens in Acts 3.21 waiting for the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets since the world began the survival of a Jewish remnant and their return to the Lord through the mercy that is extended to them by believers in whose faces they glimpse the reality of their God is his design for the salvation of a remnant of Israel in the last days so that the redeemed of the Lord may return to Zion with mourning and sighing fleeing away 
and everlasting joy upon their heads. I'm giving you such volume of things that should have taken three days to develop. I'm encouraging you to go back over the tape of this and to hear it a piece at a time. We have come to an hour in the history of the church where God is calling us beyond services. We've come to an hour where we, where we are required to be participants in the salvational purposes of God with this ancient people. And for its capital. What place is that? New York City? UN headquarters? Geneva? The law of the Lord shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 2, Micah 4 1. This is the drama of the last days, the end of human government, which is tottering and floundering. It doesn't matter whether it's a Clinton or a Dole. It's on the way out in stages of collapse. Great government, five trillion dollars in debt, six trillion. The thing is just verging on disaster. Even the German economy today is at risk, and Japan is, is just recovering from its own crisis. One earthquake in Japan, which by the way is overdue, will have such reverberations in the world as to topple the American economy, and because of the American economy, others. The whole world is lurching and ready to collapse, and human government with it, that only an antichrist can come and hope to stabilize. We're in the last days, saints. And you know why Jews will be so pursued relentlessly? Because the powers of darkness want to annihilate them. So that there's no hope of their return. No hope of their restoration. So that the kingdom, which is their kingdom on the throne of David in their city of Jerusalem, cannot be established. Uh, I should have stood in bed. Chapter 31, which is a continuation of 30. In verse 2, thus says the Lord, The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. That might well be in Canada, in Minnesota, in upstate New York, in places away from chief urban populations where for them to be recognized is to be dead. Someone's going to have to spring them out of the trap that New York City will be and put them on a path of a wilderness kind that leads them out from here and into places that are presently being prepared for them. Will you take my word for it? I know about those places. I'm on one such place, and I've been there for tw <clears throat> 22 years, <coughs> that there's a network of places of refuge being established in this country and elsewhere in the world 
in anticipation of their flight. That this is not some scenario that I have cooked up. That this is already in process. That anti-Semitic outrages are committed now every day more frequently in this country. Threatening letters to Jews, acts of violence, tombstones thrown over, graffiti written on synagogues. There's already an increasing, a daily increase of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish hatred in this country and in all countries. There's a denial of the Holocaust that had ever happened. There's something coming up out of the cracks, out of hell, against this people that finds ready acceptance among the unregenerate who are looking for simplistic answers to why the world is conking out. Jews will be the victim of this growing hatred until it reaches a point where they will no longer be able to continue in the places of security that they have obtained in the world and in this country and in this city. It will be the time of Jacob's trouble. And of that time, Jesus said, there has never been anything like it before, nor will there be again. And if that time were not cut short, no flesh would survive. But because of the elect's sake, the margin says, the chosen one's sake, that time will be cut short. Jesus said that when he was asked by his disciples, what are the signs of your coming and of the end? He said, there'll be a time of trouble worse than anything that has ever preceded it. It will eclipse even the Holocaust of the Nazi time. And no flesh will survive it except that that time were cut short. But for the elect, for the chosen one's sake, that remnant that will survive, that time will be cut short. The scriptures indicate something like a three and a half year period of flight and survival for a remnant. The word remnant is in chapter 31, verse 7. Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob and shout among the chiefs of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save thy people the remnant of Israel. How much, what percentage of a people is a remnant? Usually about a 10% tithe, a fraction of the whole. There are about 14 or 15 million Jews in the world, but only a fraction, a remnant of them will survive to return as the redeemed of the Lord. And the only reason that they will is because of you and the true church of Christ in the nations where they will be persecuted. He's bringing them, it says in verse 8, from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and she who is in labor with child together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and by supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of waters on a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him. Verse 12 says, They shall never languish again. Verse 13, the virgin shall rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and give them joy for their sorrow. There is a sorrow and mourning ahead. The redeemed of the Lord will return to Zion, and mourning and sighing shall flee away, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. We sing that as as a chorus, mindlessly, not understanding about whom we are singing. Are you braced for this? Are Are your loins girded for this? Do you have the grit and the stamina 
to watch the fulfillment of these prophetic words that will take place in our generation likely before the end of this decade or shortly thereafter we will be actual observers but God calls us to be participants in the salvation of a remnant in a time of Jacob's trouble the final sifting of Israel to find a remnant for his name and to whom he comes as king and through them to all nations that is the scenario that concludes the age and to which we are called as the church I haven't heard a single amen or rejoicing for the privilege of being participants in what concludes the age for the Lord and brings his coming have you got what it takes can you extend mercy that they might obtain mercy and is it mercy unless it costs us something can we really extend ourselves when it's not a cheapie and risk our necks for them what did they ever do for us and I think that the principal persecutors in New York City and maybe other urban centers may well be black people what's this guy's name Farrakhan a notorious anti-Semite whipping up the froth and he's got just enough truth to work with to make it incendiary Jewish landlords exploitation the kinds of things that can easily be manipulated to whip people up to a froth and so for my black brothers and sisters in this room this morning part of the test for you will be with whom will you identify when this hellish thing breaks loose and for you to stand with Jews will make you an object of contempt among your own people for not only siding with whitey but siding with your so-called exploiter you would have to be an extraordinary saint to resist uh, the, the enormous pressure that will come upon you to be one of the boys and when Jews will be saved by your mercy knowing what it cost you and at what peril it puts you in particular it will be enough to get them saved they will be moved to jealousy because they know why should you and the only reason that you should and you will is because you love their God and you love what God loves and your love is unconditional and has not to do with what their condition is but who they are in his sight as chosen and elect that they might be redeemed because you want to see their Lord come as king and you're willing even for the sacrifice of your own safety and peril in seeing to their safety oh I, I just need to pray the word has been spoken every word that I've said is true it's calculated everything is calculated against your understanding it against your desiring it it challenges you in the deepest place of your inmost being where those unconscious resentments and bitternesses and prejudices are it compels you to open yourself to the deepest sanctifying work of God that will flush it out and identify it which can only take place in a church that is a true church and not just the people looking at the back of each other's heads but who are in such an extraordinary authentic and apostolic relationship together that God can identify and deal with the depths of our own prejudices that yet lurk in our inmost beings that never rise to the surface because our Christian life is so superficial and so little is required of us and that sanctifying work will not only be to the benefit of the Jew it will be to your benefit eternally for in whatever condition you end this life you will eternally remain God's mercy and grace is so great that he gives you the challenge of the Jew to bring you to a place of faith and sanctification that would not otherwise have been yours all the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God Lord precious God mercy 
we've sung about, we've prayed, we're asking mercy to understand. Mercy to glimpse, my God, what your design is. What our call is. What our salvation means. Grow us up in this faith. Have us to be a people together who can bear such a burden for no single saint by himself will have the strength. We must be a body, a church that can be braced and fitted to perform and fulfill the mandate which is exclusively ours in the last days. Lord, I know I have spoken over the heads of many in this congregation. There's no way that anyone can have heard and understood and received, but I'm asking my God, because it's your word and your truth, not a syllable will fall to the floor. You'll bring it to the recall. They'll hear the tape. They'll talk about it one to another. What does it mean? What is that strange man saying? Can it be so? They'll examine the Scriptures. You'll lead them, my God, from text to text to text until they see and they understand what our call is. That concludes the stage. I bless them in the name of Jesus. Grant them grace upon grace, my God, that they might with joy...